Welcome to uh, this afternoon's lecture. Uh, my name is Ed Wright. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies and especially on behalf of uh, the Sally and Ralph Duchin Campus Lecture Series uh, to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. Uh, as you know, the university is, uh, is a public-private partnership. And in Judaic Studies, we're quite fortunate to have people like Sally and Ralph Duchin supporting this lecture and making it possible to uh, present uh, outside lecturers and our own faculty uh, giving lectures in their areas of expertise. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome today uh, Dr. Leonard Hammer. Uh, he has served as the pat for the past three years as the David and Andrea Stein Visiting Professor of Modern Israel Studies here at the U of A. Again, uh, the Steins are another example of how a public-private partnership works. He wouldn't be here if it wasn't for their generous support. Uh, in the fall, the modern Israel professor is Asher Susser. So we have uh, the unique opportunity to have Asher as a historian and Leonard here in the fall and Leonard here in the spring. And that is, uh, makes the reach of this uh, professorship even wider. Uh, in addition to his work here, uh, Dr. Hammer is an adjunct professor at the Hebrew University's Rothberg School and works as an international expert and consultant for the Open Society Institute. He holds a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, as well as a JD from Georgetown. After completing law school, uh, Dr. Hammer worked as the law clerk for Israeli Supreme Court Justice Menachem Milon. His research focuses on international law and human rights. His work has been supported by a host of distinguished international research grants throughout the years. Um, he is also regularly a guest at any number of research institutes throughout Europe and around the world. In addition to numerous research articles, he's the author or editor, editor of several important books, among which are The International Human Right to Freedom and Conscience, 2001, uh, An Approach to International Law, Descriptive Thoughts for Normative Issues, 2007, Holy Places in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, 2009, Sacred Space in Israel and Palestine, 2013. He's a popular lecturer uh, among students here at the university, uh, receiving very high uh, remarks on his student evaluations, and it's really our honor to have him here. Today's lecture is based on his uh, current research uh, and writing, and his, on this topic he's actually also been interviewed in several news outlets. The title of today's lecture is Israel's Proposed Basic Law, Israel as the Nation State of the Jewish People. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce my colleague, Dr. Leonard Hammer. Thanks, Ed. That's really sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have to say that I, I really am appreciative of uh, particularly Professor Ed Wright, but uh, the entire university and the Center for Judaic Studies for uh, tolerating me uh, three years now of coming here, and I particularly want to thank uh, uh, David and Andrea Stein for, for supporting me in uh, my endeavors to come out here. Um, as you can tell, third time's a charm, I guess, and uh, it really, I, every time I come here, it gets better and better. I really, I mean that sincerely, and it's such a pleasure to be out here, and I'm happy that I can impart a lecture, and hopefully it'll be interesting for all of us. Um, what I did want to speak about was the proposed, uh, and I put the proposed in, um, italics because I, it is just a proposed basic law. I'll explain to you all what a basic law is. But this basic law, Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, has been put forward by the Knesset, the parliament in Israel. Uh, this is the third or fourth, I believe, version of this particular law, the most recent one being from November 2014 that it was proposed. And arguably, I say that arguably because I don't want to uh, pump, plump up too much the lecture today and its importance. But arguably, it was the cause of the downfall of the government uh, leading to the elections that took place on March 17th. Uh, and we're still in abeyance in Israel as to who our next, who are, wh who will be the what will be the composition of our next government. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I say that this led to, arguably led to the downfall 
of the government because what happened was is that uh, this, this particular proposed basic law led to incredible dissension within the, uh, within the Israeli politic and, and certainly in the Knesset itself, which then led to the budget, uh, budget problem, meaning there was a major budget crisis, not crisis in terms of a monetary crisis, but budget in terms of agreeing between the different political parties, and that in turn led to the downfall of the government and uh, the subsequent elections that happened in March 17, 2015. So it's, I thought it would be an interesting topic to think about, to look at, and in a way it kind of reflects a lot of the, it does reflect a lot of the issues uh, that are rife in Israeli society today uh, and, and, and encapsulates a lot of the tensions and a lot of the pro inherent problems that exist in Israel uh, that I thought, again, would be a nice, uh, a nice way of thinking about some of the current issues that are happening in Israel. And hopefully we can also engage in discourse thereafter to think about uh, what, the, what, the what the proposed law is really trying to do. Well, first of all, basic laws, what are they? Israel does not have a constitution, uh, similar to the United Kingdom, uh, it does not have anything written with regard to its constitution. However, uh, what happened was is that when the state was founded, um, you can see here the first, oh, I don't know. I know all the toys in this room because I lecture in this room, so I have good toys. We declare with the elected, in accordance with the constitution, which shall be adopted by the elected constituent assembly October 1st, 1948. So basically, when the Declaration of Independence was, uh, was uh, codified or was written, uh, they envisioned that within six months from the time of the Declaration of Independence that the state itself, the state of Israel, would have a, a written constitution. Uh, the day that the state of Israel was declared or was declared on Israel uh, by the surrounding countries, including Iraq as well. And, um, and what happened was is that uh, by October uh, 1948, they were just reaching the end of cessation of hostilities, although they, they, rised up, they rose up again about a week or two later in October. So Israel never really got around to drafting up a constitution. Uh, there's a famous line by Ben Gurion who said that, the, uh, that there's no time for a constitution when we have to worry about the existence of the state itself, and that opening up the door thereafter to drafting up a constitution, it was felt by the political parties, uh, would just uh, uh, open up m for more discussion and more dissension and wouldn't really lead to anything fruitful. So the idea, the notion of having a constitution was kind of put on hold. Well, not kind of, was put on hold. As you can see, until today, there's no constitution. However, what they did propose was what's called the Harari Resolution. Harari was a member of parliament, member of Knesset, and he proposed a resolution which said that we still have a duty to prepare a constitution composed of individual <laughs> chapters, each as a separate basic law. Individual chapters to be approved by the Knesset, and all chapters shall form a constitution, and no time frame was provided. So in other words, what the uh, kind of compromise that was proposed in Israel was that there would be uh, sort of a piecemeal approach towards creating a constitution. Uh, because of course, as you all know, you do need something. You do need some type of framework in order to have a proper functioning rule of law, in order to have a proper functioning state. You have to know what your responsibilities are. You have to know what your legislature is supposed to do and what your executive is supposed to do and what your judicial branch is supposed to do and, and what are the values of your state and what's the overall perception and what are your desires in founding the, a, a state. As in any constitution, preambles are extremely important paragraphs to define and, and determine what you are trying to do in setting up the state. What are your goals? So the desire of the legislature was that there should be something that can be put forward as a means of creating some type of constitution and to be done in piecemeal fashion uh, via what's called basic laws. Uh, and we'll think about, together we'll think about in the next couple slides, what really is the significance of these basic laws. Because the truth is that these basic laws, until they're actually turned into a proper constitution, are really just like any other laws. Although they have been amplified since the early 90s by the Supreme Court. We now have in Israel, we have basic laws on the Knesset, basic laws in the president, basic laws in the government, military, basic law in the judiciary, basic law in Jerusalem, which was highly, highly uh, caused a lot of, a lot of uh, issues as well, which can be another, maybe another speech for another time. Uh, in fact, it got to the point where we even had, I'm very proud of this as an Israeli, we even had a Security Council resolution about our basic law Jerusalem condemning it uh, for a variety of different reasons, but that's just part of the fun of living in Israel. <laughs> we have a basic law on human dignity and a basic law on freedom of, of occupation and I think, I think I do, yeah, here I do have an uh, example of a basic law on human dignity. And I'm using this as a, as a typical example of what the basic laws can do because they, in a way, personify the status of basic laws. 
The purpose of this basic law is to protect human dignity and liberty in order to establish, in a basic law, the values of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. This very paragraph, the opening paragraph of this basic law on human dignity, by the way, it's from 1992. Uh, first of all, I should mention the basic law on human dignity, the basic law on freedom of occupation, uh, was the first time uh, that you had a, um, a, if you will, a form of codification of what you guys would call Bill of Rights. The first time where the Knesset, the parliament, our parliament in Israel, the legislature, got together and actually composed some type of document that encapsulates what you would call your basic civil and political freedoms. Uh, being a socialist-oriented state, we also have a basic law on freedom of occupation. That's not occupation to occupy territory. It's freedom of occupation to work. I actually had a student in one of my exams write about the basic law on freedom of occupation, and the student was talking the whole time about the occupied territories. And I was like, <laughs> It's like, well, I don't think you listened to that lecture, but I gave at least the credit for imagination on that one. You've got to give at least a point on that one. But it was so funny to read. Anyway, the point of it is, basic law on human dignity, it was the first time that we really focused on codifying, in some type of structured sense, a uh, notion of uh, some form of human rights. Now, I'm focusing on this paragraph because this paragraph, as I said, encapsulates kind of the triangle that's been identified as the key factors driving our state, driving the state of Israel. That is, a Jewish state, a democratic state, and a state based on uh, notions of, let's call them civil liberties, or human, I'll call them human rights. It's kind of my, more of my vernacular, because I work in the international human rights context, more of a human, and, and human rights. And they each imply different things. And part of this proposed basic law that we're going to talk about today is to think about what are the implications of Israel being a Jewish democratic state that has also some linkages to individual human rights or autonomy of the individual. I have the new status of basic laws and I have a question mark exclamation point I guess as emphasis or emphasis in this particular case and that is because uh, what really are the status of the basic laws? Well, I said to you all that they're kind of a precursor, kind of a framework for an eventual constitution, which would imply that maybe they do have an elevated status. Well, until 1992, when this basic law of human dignity and the other basic law on freedom of occupation were codified by the legislature, the treatment of basic laws by the courts, particularly by the Supreme Court in Israel, was essentially as kind of any other law with a minor, some type of form of elevation. In other words, that there was some elevated aspect to the law itself, but in a generalized sense, basic laws were like any other laws, and they had some type of elevated sense of recognizing that maybe they will be eventually, that maybe they, they will eventually serve uh, as, a con for, as a constitution, right? a framework for an eventual constitution. Along comes these basic laws on human dignity, basic law on freedom of occupation, and the Supreme Court, in their, by, by 1994 and 1995, declared that it's the basis of these basic laws on human dignity and basic freedom of occupation that provide us with formalized grounds for judicial review. Think of Marbury versus Madison, a la the great <coughs> Supreme Court Justice of John Marshall here in the United States. Uh, similar to your constitution, you don't have any right of judicial review. It was a kind of a judicially mandated uh, notion that was created here in the United States. And the court in Israel kind of did the same thing. The kind of said is, well, now that we have these essential laws that relate to basic civil liberties or basic notions of human dignity, we're going to rely on these basic laws. And from here on in, basic laws are of an elevated status, a kind of a quasi-constitutional status. And on the basis of these basic laws of human dignity, basic law freedom of occupation, uh, they have overturned laws in a direct fashion. Prior to these basic laws, uh, did the court overturn laws on the, in the same way that you would do here in judicial review, i.e. declare them unconstitutional? Not really. The court would more, more likely say, is, we're sending them back to you, Mr. Legislature. Please look over these laws and think about the various principles or various notions that are essential or, or important to our state. From here on in, from 1992 onward, the court, Supreme Court in Israel in particular, was extremely uh, open to allowing for judicial review and uh, overturning uh, Knesset laws uh, left and right in a very, actually, kind of a, a, kind of a, a, a stark manner. In other words, directly confronting the legislature, directly confronting the executive. And I'm not going to get into the whole debate that we have in Israel with regard, to judicial, with regard to judicial activism, but I'm mentioning this is because we'll see in the proposed basic law that the legislature is actually trying to curtail somewhat the power of the Israeli Supreme Court. And we'll get to that in a second. 
But I just want to point out that there is, an ele- there is today, 2015, an elevated status to basic laws as of a quasi-constitutional nature. And that's what I have here about judicial review. The capacity for judicial review, if it's contrary to a basic law, meaning, for example, if it's contrary to the, a basic law on human dignity, and the notion of human dignity is accorded a very broad type of uh, interpretation, or if it's contrary to a fundamental principle of the foundation of the state. And I mention that because we'll see as we discuss uh, further on in the, in the lecture uh, that the Declaration of Independence is also accorded some type of legal standing, some type of legal status. In other words, contrary, uh, prior to having the basic law on human dignity and freedom of occupation, the sole source in which the, court can, which the courts in Israel looked for human rights or some type of civil liberty protections emanated from the Declaration of Independence itself which is very strange, right? Your Declaration of Independence here, uh, sitting, I guess, in Philadelphia, uh, is basically just a document. It's indicative of what you want to do in your state, but it doesn't necessarily have legal standing. In Israel, the Declaration of Independence is actually relied upon and utilized as a, a source by which we can discern the fundamental principles of the state itself. And I mention that because we'll see also in this proposed basic law that there's a lot of, uh, uh, how can I say it, uh, references, almost direct quotes, from the Declaration of Independence. And I'm mentioning that because a lot of the uproar and the brouhaha over the proposed basic law uh, I found somewhat amusing uh, in that a lot of the principles and a lot of the ideas that were stated, that are stated in the proposed basic law have been around since 1948. There were other aspects of the law that I think were overlooked by other individuals that actually should raise the ire or at least the concern of various individuals. But nevertheless, that's kind of how these things pan out, that usually it's a big deal is made about things that should not be made about, and then uh, the more important issues are overlooked. And again, that's part of what we'll look at in this lecture today of what really are the issues, what are the issues that are happening here. Thinking about why 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 this basic law was proposed, uh, over the past couple of years, well, there's a whole bunch of different reasons. One is, of course, the ever omnipresent, particularly in Israeli context, of politics. And by that I mean uh, politics both internal and external. External politics, of course, thinking about the Israel as a, a Jewish state uh, vis-a-vis the surrounding Arab-Israeli conflict, vis-a-vis the, the surrounding Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, The external factor, external aspect is linked to the constant call by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the presumed current prime minister, uh, with regard to uh, uh, recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, as one of the preconditions to actually continuing with dialogue uh, with the Palestinian Authority. And that's linked to the idea of of politics because it's saying is that we want to entrench this notion of Israel as a Jewish state. So right away, the political external politics have an effect. Internal politics also are part of this issue, and that is uh, the internal politics between where you stand as Israel being declared a Jewish state. Saying that Israel is a Jewish and democratic state has implications, but the implications that differ differ for uh, everybody. What does it mean to be a Jewish state? Oh, we're a theocracy. Oh, not really, because... we're not really a theocracy, but we do have Jewish leanings or Jewish religious leanings. Oh, we're a, a culturally Jewish state. Well, not really, because we have other individuals who actually practice Judaism, and not in a cultural manner, but in a more uh, active manner. Uh, maybe we're just a Jewish state that's based on humanistic principles that emanate from Judeo-Christian ethics. Oh, well, maybe, but then we also have uh, support by the state, not just of Jewish institutions, i.e. religious institutions, not just Jewish institutions, but of course also of Muslim and Christian institutions. So it can't just be that it's just these generalized principles. I should also mention that, <coughs> excuse me, I should also mention that the Jewish and democratic notion should not, I know this might be hard to conceive, but should not be perceived as being in conflict with one another. In fact, uh, Ruth Gavi's own, I'll talk about her la- uh, later on, um, asserts that th- we're not talking about a binary process here of one or the other. We're talking about, and this is the perception in Israel, this is my perception too, naturally, I guess, uh, after living in Israel, but the perception of a Jewish and democratic state is not perceived by Israelis as inherently contradictory. 
Uh, of course, it depends who you ask, and it depends who you ask as to what it means to be a Jewish state. But the idea is, is that they can coexist. The question is how. So politics certainly rears its head with regard to this proposed basic law because what they're trying to do is entrench a certain ideological notion as to what Jewish state actually means, once and for all, if you will. You know, it's something to think about. Law is, uh, I know it solves a lot of our problems and it creates a lot of order in our society, but law is decisive. Law is declaratory. Usually you get to a law once you've come to a decision as to where you stand, once you've come to a conclusion and understanding, and then you codify it in the law. And that's part of the issue with regard to this proposed basic law is that the Israeli society overall really has not come to an understanding of what it means to be a Jewish and democratic state. And forget even uh, among the Jews. When I say Jewish state or Jewish and democratic state, so right away I'm thinking about, of course, within the Jewish community itself, i.e. Israeli Jews, but also as Israeli Arabs. What's the implication of that? So there's a, there's a number of factors here with regard to the stance of the state of Israel and what it means to be a Jewish state. You also have a separation of power struggle that I had alluded to beforehand, and that's, that's getting at the notion of the power of the court, the Supreme Court in particular. The Supreme Court in Israel is kind of an interesting institution in that unlike your Supreme Court here, and actually, well, in many countries, not in all, uh, the uh, capacity to engage the Israel Supreme Court is in the first instance. What that means is, and that's a vestige, it's a leftover of the mandate. During the mandate, uh, the Brits didn't really trust the local courts. So what they, what they did is they said, well, if there are any types of issues that you have with regard to the ruling authorities, i.e. the mandatory authorities, you have the right of first instance of engaging our Supreme Court here that we have, you know, suppose I call it a Supreme Court, but it was called something different, or our higher elevated court that we have here as a means of challenging uh, any types of decisions that we might have made. And that was carried over into Israel. And what that means is that the Supreme Court wears many, many different hats. They can wear a hat of an appellate court. They can wear a hat of a constitutional court. They can also wear a hat of what's called the Beit Mishpat Gavod at Tzedek, a Bagatz, a High Court of Justice. When the Supreme Court is wearing a High Court of Justice hat, that is the first court that you have engaged. You haven't gone to a district court or a magistrate court or certainly an appellate court. You've gone straight to the Supreme Court. And there's a reserve for instances of any challenges that you might have or desire to have against any type of governmental decision, be it a military decision, be it a local town council decision, uh, maybe local town council, you might have to go to a local court first, but certainly a Knesset decision. Any type of impact that occurs on you as a result of governmental action, you have the right of going to the Supreme Court in the first instance and challenging that action uh, before the Supreme Court, before the High Court of Justice. Now I say that because th the separation of power struggle is really quite profound uh, as a result of this capacity to engage the Supreme Court to get to receive their voice, to hear what they're thinking, to engage the judicial review uh, is really quite quick. Yeah, it might take a couple of years till you actually have a decision. But the fact that you can go straight directly before the Supreme Court allows a fast track to engage this notion of judicial review. Footnote, that's part of the reasons why uh, if you are, for example, a Palestinian living, a Palestinian Arab living in, uh, uh, in, in, if you want to call it occupied territory, disputed territory, Judea Samaria, West Bank, whatever you want to call it, uh, if you're living there and a mil the military does an action against you, but you're not a citizen of Israel, you still have a right of challenging uh, that action directly before this Israeli Supreme Court. It's a vestige of the mandatory authorities, and for better or for worse, it allows for these challenges to occur before the High Court of Justice, the Supreme Court of Israel. So the Supreme Court of Israel has a rather, can be and has become rather active and has a rather active role to play within the broader Israeli politique because I, uh, A, either uh, the Israeli politic, is really the, the legislature or the executive does not deal with many of the issues because they just don't have the wherewithal politically to hold together a coalition and make decisions or because individuals like myself, somebody living in disputed territories, or somebody else in Israel, have the capacity to engage and challenge the government immediately before the Supreme Court. And the separation of power struggle is, is really quite stark. 
and the legislature, and I should say particularly the executive, especially when you're the ruling coalition, don't like it. Don't like that individual engage, engage the Supreme Court and do not like how activist the court has become. And part of the contention is, of course, is as you all know, if you have an activist court, uh, what happens is it becomes a political body. And you don't want that. You want to maintain a rule of law and you want to maintain a separation of powers. I'm not saying that this law answers those questions, but that's part of the reason why this law was proposed, was to try to rein in the power of the court. Finally, and maybe this should have been first, I should say maybe most importantly, but at least this is from the, what's called the legislative histories. We call it the Knesset, the Knesset words, if you will, what you guys would call legislative history. Uh, entrenchment of the views with regard to the state of Israel. What is the state itself? What does it really mean? There's no uh, actual statement in law with regard to any like, kind of like preambulatory type of provisions in a constitution that go towards what does it mean to be a Jewish and democratic state. And part of the idea of this law was to kind of fill in these gaps that exist within Israeli law uh, in that there's no actual law, or I should say actual basic law, that go towards the fundamental ideas that are inherent in the state itself. Uh, let's take a look at, some of the, at the proposed basic law and see what it's telling us. State of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people, wherein the Jewish people fulfills its yearning for self-determination in accordance with its historical and cultural heritage. So right away, this proposed basic law, this is the first paragraph of this proposed basic law, is focusing on the idea of self-determination of the Jewish people, the idea of Israel as the national home for the Jewish people, and his, uh, it, it recognizing its historical and cultural heritage, i.e. its connection to the state itself. The right of national self-determination in the state is unique to the Jewish people, and this basic law and all the others shall be interpreted in conformity to this provision. Now, first of all, we see paragraphs one and two going towards the direct reason for creating this proposed basic law, or creating this basic, proposing this basic law, and that is the idea of self-determination, that is the idea of entrenching the state of Israel as the national home of the Jewish people. The third paragraph is quite interesting, because what it's saying is that this basic law and all other laws are, shall be interpreted in conformity with this provision. That means that what they're trying to do is say to the Supreme Court, in the future, when you go ahead and interpret interpret what human dignity means, or, if, or what freedom of occupation means, or any other aspects that relate possibly or potentially to human rights or other aspects that relate to your decisions, you have to interpret it in accordance with recognizing that the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people. We'll talk about some of the impacts that probably will not have, uh, because I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean in, in another couple of minutes, but I want you just to bear in mind this is what they're getting at. Let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence is not a long document. I copied just uh, bits and pieces, and I'll copy some other pieces here. But I did want to show you guys that the, a lot of the language that's in this law itself is relating to what was already stated in 1948 in the Declaration of Independence. Eretz Israel is the birthplace of the Jewish people. Notice, of course, the reference to Eretz Israel is a reference to the biblical aspect. It's not the state of Israel, Medinat Israel. It's the land of Israel, and that's a direct reference to a biblical aspect. This Declaration of Independence was written by secular people. They were not driven by religious impulses. Yeah, they had some religious Zionists who, of course, composed the first Knesset, but in the general sense, uh, the Mapai Party, the Labor Party, ruled, held sway in Israel till easily to the late 1970s. So you're talking about a heavily secularist uh, body of individuals coming together. The Zionist, the Zionist uh, movement is a secular, largely a secularist movement. Uh, don't, be, don't be swayed by what you might read in the papers. Eretz Yisrael is a reference to the biblical reference to Israel itself, birthplace of the Jewish people, spiritual, religious, political identity, the historical description that, that goes on here, never cease to pray and return, restoration of, their, of it, in, uh, of it, in, in it sorry, of their political freedom. And there's a whole bunch of other paragraphs here that talk about uh, the historical connection to the land, tracing it from Abraham uh, all the way up to, well, the Balfour Declaration, all the way up through the Holocaust. A reference to history, immigration movement, Zionist movement, Balfour Declaration, League of Nations, etc. In other words, in, entrenching the notion uh, that this, uh, this particular area, whatever the dimensions might be, uh, is uh, part of the self-determination movement of the Jewish people. Catastrophe, which, by the way, 
uh, we're at the eve of remembrance of Yom HaShoah, remembrance of the uh, day, uh, it's a day of, of uh, 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 respite, I guess, in a way, to think about what happened to, during the time of the Holocaust. This is what they're referring to here, massacre of millions of Jews in Europe, and elsewhere, I should say, was in a declared demonstration of the urgency of solving the problem of its homelessness by reestablishing an as to say, out of the Jewish state, which would open the gates of the home men to every Jew, description of the Holocaust. It's a little bit longer. And then they have the uh, recognition by the UNGA, General Assembly of the United Nations, passing a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael. Currently, we members of the Council, by virtue of a natural historic right, strength of the uh, United Nations, declare it to be establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael to be known as the State of Israel. That is reflecting the first two paragraphs that are stated in this proposed basic law. And that's why I say it's not saying anything new, at least right now. It's things, it's ideas, it's notions, it's ideals that were driving these individuals that have been around even before 1948. And it's ideas and it's notions and ideals, and I'm sorry to throw these all together because it's, I'm not even encapsulating enough of the, uh, 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 how can I say, incentives that, that move forward to create some type of Jewish state or to create the state of Israel. But what's happening here is, is that the, uh, the idea of self-determination is now being encapsulated into this proposed basic law. And that's part of the reason, that is the reason, why they wanted to propose this basic law. Because it was there, it's inherent in society, Israeli society. Uh, Jews know why it's there, meaning those who live in Israel. Israeli Arabs know why it's there as well. Uh, yes, there are issues with that, and we could talk about that, but I want you to be aware that in the overall, the creation of the Israel was to be a Jewish state. What that means, that's another issue entirely. What that implies, that's another issue entirely. That's for us, for me, and everybody else who lives in Israel to work out, and I mean that collectively. But to have it stated within a basic law was important to the legislature, and it's encapsulating what's basically stated here in the Declaration of Independence. Going on and looking at the purpose, purpose of this basic law, this is a second section of a proposed basic law. I took, I took the most recent version. It's gone through different incantations. Some things were removed, some things were put in. I could talk about that later. Purpose of this basic law is to secure the character of Israel as the national state of Jewish people, codify in a basic law the values of Israel as a Jewish democratic state, in the spirit of the principles of its Declaration of Independence. Again, this is the troika that exists in Israel. Jewish, democratic, principles of the Declaration. I should mention, I think I have it later on. Here it is. Declaration of Independence is, is basically saying the state will be based on freedom. It does say freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. That's going to be quoted over here somewhere. And it will ensure a complete equality of social and political rights of all its inhabitants. Uh, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. Okay. Um, the Declaration of Independence was utilized by the Supreme Court, and that's why I say it's more of a legal document, more so at least than the United States, for example, as grounds for finding these fundamental principles on which a state is based. Fundamental principles of a Jewish state, fundamental principles of a democratic state, fundamental principles of a state based on human rights. And that's what's encapsulated in this particular paragraph with it. In fact, the court will rely on this particular paragraph to demonstrate the fundamental principles that are essential to the state. Freedom, justice, peace, equality of social political rights of all its inhabitants. Democratic state, this is the second, this is going back to the proposed basic law. The state of Israel shall have a democratic regime based on the foundations of freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel, committed to the individual rights of all its citizens as detailed by all basic laws. Well, that's it. This is the basic law. And this is, the this is the basic law, and this is the Declaration of Independence. It's a reflection of one or the other. I say about the Troika up here, Jewish, Democratic, and Declaration of Independence, because that's what they're trying to encapture here and here. Trying to say is, well, we have these fundamental principles, we have these fundamental notions, we do have a desire to create a Jewish state, and we do have a desire to have it some type of democratic regime, democratic context, democratic framework for the government itself. Uh, this is just, I wanted to reference the right of return. Every Jew shall have the right to immigrate to Israel and to obtain citizenship in accordance with the provisions of the law. That is called the right of return. That was one of the first laws that was passed in Israel after the state was declared. And that is to compare it to, I call DOI, Declaration of Independence. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration, etc. And of course, and then the right of return as a law itself. So in other words, what we're seeing is, is that the proposed basic law is saying we know we have the right of return, 
That was a foundational principle of establishing the state of Israel, and now we're going to place that within the law itself, within this proposed basic law itself, uh, the Jew, every, every Jew have the, has the right to immigrate to Israel. I should point out uh, uh, that uh, there are many states that have this notion of favoring, if you will, a particular ethnic group or a particular group with regard to moving to a particular country. Uh, I challenge any of you to become a Greek citizen unless you are of Greek ancestry. I challenge any of you to become a German citizen unless you're of German ancestry. The laws still apply today. If you are a Greek, if you are a Greek ancestry, I don't know the exact depth that you have to have, meaning does it have to be your great, 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 great grandfather, or, can it, or must it be just a grandfather, or whatever it might be, uh, but you will not become a Greek citizen unless you have some type of connection. Germany kind of readapted their nationality laws about three, four years ago, maybe even four or five years ago, but not to, the, not to such a great extent. And I'm using, you know, I'm using European countries on purpose. Israel is closer to being a more of a European type of uh, country than it is of an American country, uh, than America, sorry. And of course, in America, you also have your issues with regard to uh, restrictions. I'm not saying, you know, it's an incredible country built on immigration, don't get me wrong. And it's, an it's actually because of immigration that it is such an incredible country. But you put qu caps, you put quotas. Jeez, uh, I mean, I work with human rights here in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Arizona. Just go down to Nogales, take a look at the wall there. Uh, go to the Calibri Center here in the University of Arizona, uh, you know, dealing with people who are dying on the way to get into the country. So there, there are always issues with regard to uh, who can and cannot come into any country. And it's a sovereign right of any state. I should also add is that Israel is not, do, it does not uh, limit the capacity of other individuals to move to Israel. I always make the joke, when I moved there in, in the mid-80s, uh, you know, people looked at me, I was moving from America, I went to some Hatsi Tatsi law school, I uh, could have made a lot of money, you know, it was Reagan years, and they're like, why, why are you moving to some really cruddy country like Israel? It's like nothing there, and it's really, there's no opportunity there or anything. And, you know, I had my reasons why, but well, it was part of my self-determination as, as myself as a Jewish person. Uh, but, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, but, but nowadays, so back then it was sort of like a oh, big deal if they have the right of return, who wants to go there anyway? Nowadays it's unbelievable how many, uh, how many people want to come. Yeah, it's incredible. We have huge refugee problems nowadays. I find it always fascinating to see the people clamoring to get people who are clamoring to get into the state of Israel. I find it almost amusing uh, and uh, somewhat flattering, I guess, on a certain level too. But nevertheless, it's, the notion is there that it's, specific, it, it's geared towards Jewish immigration, and that relates to what I showed you in the previous slide of Declaration of Independence of recognizing the historical moment of what was happening in 1948 and, and forward and henceforth. And that is that Jews needed some type of place to go to. Post-emancipation, rise of economic, what, what could be called racial or economic anti-Semitism, uh, obviously after the Holocaust, uh, it, was, it was needed. The Jewish question was in the lips of the European leaders since the early 1900s, uh, 1800s, excuse me, with the rise of nationalism. And of course with the burgeoning population that occurred throughout the world. This is not new stuff. These are ideas that have been there, and Israel was the answer to many of these issues. Uh, the connection to the Jewish people in the diaspora, I wanted to point this out. The state will act to strengthen the connection between Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. Uh, it's kind of, I kind of always have this shuddering when I read this after Bibi's comments uh, during the most recent election and beforehand with regard to the attack on the uh, French, on the French uh, Jewish uh, kosher store in the uh, after the Charlie Hebdo incident, people tend to forget that there were four Jews that were killed, actually. Three Jews that were killed and four that were heavily injured. Everybody thinks about Charlie Hebdo, but uh, whatever. The point of it is, is that the act to strengthen the connection between Israel and Jews. The state will extend a helping hand to members of the Jewish people in distress or in captivity on account of their being Jews. We see that. We saw that. Operation Moses, taking Jews out of Iraq, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I have this as note the universal jurisdiction because uh, it's quite interesting. If you look at Israeli laws, and this is kind of a, uh, ironic and maybe somewhat hypocritical on Israel's part, we don't like universal jurisdiction. We don't like it when our generals or our soldiers are challenged before a, a court in Belgium or in England uh, for violating presumed violation, and yes, I say presumed because I'm willing to take that on, a violation of international humanitarian law. Uh, and we say, oh, universal jurisdiction, it's dangerous, it's not good. But the truth is that we have universal jurisdiction in our laws, too. We have criminal laws 
uh, that protect Jews from around the world. If genocide is committed against Jews anywhere else in the world, Israel claims under its domestic law that it has a right of, of intervening. Uh, and this law kind of encapsulates that, of extending a helping hand to Jewish people who are in distress or in captivity. Uh, interesting type of provision in here, of course, because one has to think about, well, what if a Jew is a national of another state? What right do we have as Israelis to, Israelis to go in there and say, oh, you're another Jew and we want to go ahead and protect you? It's something to think about. And it is a form of universal jurisdiction. So it's kind of an interesting aspect to think about or to contrast, if you will, between universal jurisdiction exercised by, particularly by European states, uh, against Israelis, as opposed to Israel thinking about its application of universal jurisdiction. Clearly there are distinctions, but I just wanted to throw that out as an interesting idea. Preservation of culture, heritage, and identity. Each resident of Israel, without regard to his religion or nationality, notice, of course, it's talking about everybody, and notice it's using the word resident, not citizen. We have uh, probably nowadays, we have about 130, 140,000 refugees and migrant workers in, the, in this, I'm not even, you know, I'm talking about residents, i.e. non-citizens. I'm not talking about Israeli Arabs who are citizens. And of course, uh, thinking about, for example, in East Jerusalem, where you have individuals who are residents who did not want to become Israeli citizens, uh, but they are considered residents of Israel itself. Each resident of Israel shall be entitled to strive for the preservation of his cultural heritage, language, and identity. Culture, la heritage, language, and identity, my friends, is what encapsulates what we call in international human rights minority rights. Minority rights are that. That's it. It's not a very big basket. The notion of minority rights is to allow for the existence of a state without undermining the state from within, but also preserving the minority, be it the, and referencing their culture, language, and identity. Heritage as well, obviously, here. Uh, that's what it's referring to. It's referring to the notion of minority rights. If you take a look at the Declaration of the Rights of Minorities, the only uh, human rights treaty that mentions minority rights is the International Covenant of Civil Political Rights. Other than that, it's not, really, it's not mentioned anywhere else, minority rights. Yet they're quite strong, quite powerful. Partially from the League of Nations treaties, but more, more, more so from the Declaration on the Rights of Minorities and understanding of what kind of rights want, should be or want, want to be accorded to minorities. States are hesitant to accord too much to minorities for obvious reasons, because then you'll have breakaway republics all of a sudden. So the idea here is, is to preserve notions of some type of, uh, some type of minority rights protection. The state may permit a community, including members of single religion, to establish separate community settlements. We'll put that aside for a second. Uh, that's redrafted language. They actually removed this. Um, I made edits to this presentation, and they, didn't, they weren't saved, so I'm kind of stuck. I actually, they, they removed this provision from the, from the uh, law itself. But basically, it's just, it's just referring to the capacity to create new forms of communities. Um, not going into too much history, but Israel is linked to the Millet system that was established by the Ottoman Empire, carried through the mandate system. And that's the notion that you can, ha you can and do have uh, coexisting religious communities uh, uh, working side by side with regard to certain issues like personal laws, like marriage, divorce, things like that allowing for the coexistence of different religious bodies. And that's what they're getting at here is the coexistence of different religious bodies. Declaration of Independence, I just wanted to point out, guarantee freedom of religion, conscious language, education, and culture, etc. Encapsulating the minority rights that I referenced beforehand of religion, language, and culture. Religion, language, and culture are, are encapsulating human rights, basically minority rights in, in the international human rights context. And that's what they're getting at here with regard to protection, preserving the cultural heritage, preserving the heritage. Jewish civil law, and this is a biggie, where a court decides that a dispute cannot be resolved by statute or judicial precedent, strict legal analogy. It shall render its decision in accordance with the principles of freedom, justice, equity, and peace. They sound like Superman. Derived from Jewish civil law. Now, notice the term here. The, law that, the laws that were in are, are in existence in Israel today stop right here. Shall be decided in accordance with the principles of freedom, justice, equity, and peace, period. I have no idea what these things mean, by the way, and I'm a lawyer. But they added on to this, particular, to this particular paragraph, derived from Jewish civil law. And that I have down here is a note influence on the Supreme Court. What I'm getting at here is, is that, similar to what we saw in that first paragraph, that this basic law shall now influence all other basic laws, well, this is it. They want to focus, they want the court to focus on Jewish civil law, and in parentheses, mishpat ivri. Uh, I, as Professor Wright pointed out, I was a law clerk for Menachem Elon. He was the, for two years, I was fortunate to do so. 
on the Israel Supreme Court. He was, he passed on about two years ago, he was the foremost uh, um, um, expert on Mishpat Tifoli, on using Jewish civil law in the decisions, and I'm relying, I should say, upon Jewish civil law, Mishpat Tifoli, as a means of interpreting or further extrapolating or, or uh, uh, understanding issues that might arise before the court, he would reference the Jewish law itself. And what they're kind of, what they're trying to do here is curtail the influence of the Supreme Court by referring to generalized notions of what human dignity means. No, 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 no. If there's something that's not clear to you with regard to what human dignity means under this proposed basic law, yeah, look at these principles of freedom, justice, equity, and peace, very lovely, but as they arrive from Jewish civil law. You, Mr. Court, we're forcing you now to think about those type of principles, but we want it in the context of Mishpat Divili. We want it in the context of Jewish law. Uh, pre, ah, uh, this is, uh, what is this, number uh, 14? Preservation of holy sites. The holy sites shall be protected against desecration, all their damage, and against anything that would interfere with the freedom of access of religious groups to places holy to them or to the sensibilities regarding said holy sites. Whoa. That is seriously broad stuff. Can anybody guess what they're getting at here? Who they're, who, they're, uh, who they're targeting? Anybody ever want to access the Temple Mount if you're Jewish? Not that easy, even though it's the holiest site for Jews. Uh, this is making a direct change. The Holy Places Law from 1967, which is in, has been in existence since the Six Day War, uh, allows for freedom of access, but does not, has no way such broad language uh, as stated in this particular law. Freedom of access of religious groups to places holy to them. Whoa, that is direct reference to the capacity of uh, going up in the Temple Mount, for Jews to go up in the Temple Mount. I'm not going to get into that lecture. Maybe it's another lecture for next year. Temple Mount is being under, in essence, the ages of the Waqf, uh, be it Jordanian or Palestinian. I'll let them fight that one out. I don't have to get involved in that too much. Uh, but uh, the assertion by Jews is, is that they also want to go up there to pray, and they're heavily limited for a whole bunch of different reasons, both by Israel and, and the Waqf itself. So, something to think about, but there's no doubt that's what they're getting at here with regard to the access, freedom of access, against anything that would interfere. I mean, that's really broad language to have in a law. In fact, I find that really dangerous language to have in a law, but we'll put that one aside. Depart uh, Declaration of Independence, it, the state, will safeguard the holy places of all religions. Uh, just again, just to reference the language of where this emanates from, the desires of where this comes from with regard to creating this proposed basic law. Pros and cons of this basic law, and then we'll open it up for discussion if there are any, uh, if there are any questions and such, which I, I hope and I'm sure there will be. Um, first of all, Dive Knesset. I, I wanted to reference the Dive Knesset, the, the uh, legislative histories, uh, history sorry, that exists within the, uh, I'm sorry, that, that, is, that, is, uh, uh, that provides us with an understanding of why this law was made, and that kind of is, relates to what I referenced at the beginning, but I just want to make sure that it's clear. And that is a desire to place in a basic law that Israel is, uh, that Israel is uh, as a Jewish state, recognizing the history uh, creation, uh, with regard to the creation of Israel, and also entrenching the Declaration of Independence, meaning the fundamental principles that were stated in the Declaration of Independence, that they should then be uh, codified, if you could use that term, um, in, in a law itself, as well as allowing for some notions of equality uh, for the general populace. And that's kind of what the Knesset says. Attorney General, at the time it was a General we Attorney General Weinstein, now it's somebody, uh, they moved on, uh, was actually against this law. He was not for this law. He was not a supporter of this particular law. Uh, in fact, the legislature wanted to get the Attorney General involved, and he goes, no, he doesn't support it, and he, he actually did not take any, any, uh, any part in this law. He felt uh, that it, was, uh, it creates an Im imbalance in society, and, uh, and that there's no reason to engage these rather difficult is issues, and it's an undue infringement of individual rights. In other words, in this balance that, that is attempted to exist in Israel with regard to being Jewish, democratic, and a human rights context, he, Attorney General Weinstein felt that the human rights context was being cut up too much, and too much was being given to the Jewish side, and partially to the democratic side. Whether that's true or not is another issue, but it was interesting to look at to see the Attorney General actually railing against the particular law. I do want to mention two other academics here. Alon Harel uh, takes a, 
kind of a typical, you know, kind of, a, I shouldn't say typical, but he takes a, a, a rather a, a liberalist interpretation, so I thought that would be interesting, and Gavi's own is, doesn't go as far as him. I think Gavi's own is a bit more developed, if you will, uh, and that's not meant to belittle any of them, but it's just a, their perceptions. Harrell thought, uh, thought two things. One is he, he, like the Attorney General, felt that, the, uh, that there was not enough protection for minorities and minority rights, and he also was concerned, and this is probably, uh, probably has some truth to it, he was concerned with how the notion of a Jewish state would be interpreted. He was concerned in particular that it would be usurped by uh, the uh, religious, uh, uh, by, by, the ultra, by the orthodox and, and ultra-orthodox in the state which is, is actually a, rather, a, a growing number of percentage of people, uh, given the birth rate. Meaning in two generations, right now it's about 35, uh, probably uh, inching up to 40%. In a generation or two, it would probably reach 45, 50%. Kind of interesting to think about. Maybe Israel will become a theocracy, I don't know. But it is something to account for. And I, uh, Harel was, was nervous about that. Gavizon's more of an interesting character. And Gavizon, I think, merits a little bit of a, uh, two or three minutes just to talk about, not about her, but what she said about the law. She was approached in 2013 uh, by Tzipi Livni, who was then the uh, mini uh, uh, ju uh, justice, Minister of Justice, uh, to analyze the law and to propose a, an acceptable, if you will, Toyota draft for the law itself. Uh, and what's really funny and typical is really fashion. Uh, she came out with her uh, um, uh, proposals about a week after they, she said, look, I'm coming out with them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue them. And then they said, no, 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 we want to do our own law. And they proposed this basic law, and then, then Gavi Sun's report came out about a week later. So I'm sure there's a whole bunch of different politics going on in there. But Gavi Sun's is interesting because what she's saying is, is, she said two things in her report. First, she said, is why are you doing this? Uh, it's, she said, and to her credit, she said, if you really want to uh, engage, uh, if you really want to come to an understanding of what uh, Israel is, then engage in civil discourse, which she did, by the way. She interviewed, a, that's why it took her so long. She interviewed people from all streams of, uh, of Israel, of Israel society, i.e. not just Jews, but also Israeli Arabs and other individuals. And of course, within the Jewish streams, all the individuals, it's a very stratified society. And uh, her, her contention was, or at least her, her first uh, recommendation uh, to the Knesset was, don't do this. Uh, better, you're not going to do anything good with doing this. And it's again, it's that, what I was saying at the beginning with regard to law. You don't write a law if you're still unclear as to what the law is or should be. What should Israel be? What does it mean to be a Jewish state? Don't draft up a law and then say, okay, yeah, it's like forcing a, a circle into a square or vice versa. First, figure out what size you need to put into that circle or square. And her contention was, is that, go talk to people. Let's engage in civil discourse. Let's work out the issues that might exist between all of us. I know it sounds a little kumbaya type stuff, you know, holding hands and singing uh, John Lennon songs. But nevertheless, it's the idea, and, and she actually has a lot of merit to what she's, she has a lot of merit to what she's saying. The idea is that civil discourse is quite important because you want to include as many people as you can uh, within, that, within that public discourse, within that civil discourse. She also said that, uh, that there should be... So if, she said, if you do want to go ahead, w w go ahead excuse me, with the law itself, uh, then you should use softer language. Don't use such strong language in this law. You know, you're kind of hitting us over the head with that uh, idea of proposing this hardcore Jewish state, not accounting for other ideas as well. And yeah, there is some, I believe there is some balance in this law, and I believe it does reflect a lot of what the Declaration of Independence is asserting, but, uh, you know, there could be more as well. There always could be more, I guess. And she was, she was, going, she was moving for uh, somewhat of softer language with regard to the law itself, and uh, also accounting for, she felt there should be a greater accounting for the uh, Israeli-Arab minority within the law. Um, um, and finally, and this is what I think why Gavi's own is, is so important, finally she said, uh, the Jewish and democratic aspect of the state, and you can hear the, the, the echoes of Jewish and democratic have been echoing uh, throughout the state uh, throughout, I'm sorry, the existence of Zionism as to what it really means uh, for, you know, since the mid-1800s uh, is, is not a contradictory assessment or assertion, but it's something that goes together. And the question really is, is how to go about doing that, how to go about creating this, this uh, fusion between being a Jewish state, which Jews have a right to do, she says, and, but also being a democratic state that it supports and, and uh, respects a variety of different human rights. 
Well, with that, I'll open it up to questions if you guys have, and uh, uh, more than happy to elaborate further. Please. Oh. Thank you.